And to be fair, we've never regretted it. You win, you win back to back. You win back to back six stations championships, uh, and and still, and, and I and I, I'm being unfair to George. There's still, is there is there still an element of doubt in your mind, though? No, there's no element of, uh, of doubt in terms of Joe Schmidt. I actually think uh, Joe Schmidt. He always strikes me since he's come into the job. He's been he's like like a fella cramming for a job. You must remember a couple of things about Joe Schmidt. He was never. I mean, there was one salient point that was made after Ireland went to Argentina last summer. A lot of the players came back, um, and there were, it was a very intense two test tour, very intense, and um, it was almost as if it was overload at the end of a season. But Joe Schmidt made a comment where he said, I was never on a tour in my life. No. Think about it. Joe Schmidt played for the Bay of Plenty went into coaching, came over with Claremont, he was Claremont's assistant coach. Uh, Leinster took a leap of faith when they made him a head coach. So he had been involved in what we'd call club rugby in his whole professional career. Which means you have access to players five days a week, 50 weeks a year. And that's when you can fine tune the nuances of your game. I think it has still taken him the two years to uh, like he's always holding back, he's always afraid of trying to put in too much. He learned from the first game when Ireland lost to Australia in the November of his first um, tournament in charge, or the first period in charge. Uh, there was definitely an overload on the players. They were thinking about it too much, and as a result of that, I think he's pulled back. I think for the first time, he's going to have four months of total and utter... Um, Available, all the players will be available to him. So I think there's capacity in this Irish group to go up 10 or 20 percent. Uh, and all, all of that's fair, Donald. But if you go back to 2007, there was an awful lot of stuff being said about the Irish team then going in with what was considered a golden generation of players and having the same sort of ability yeah, and the same totally, sort of opportunity. Totally different, though. Eddie O'Sullivan. Why? Eddie O'Sullivan was a fantastic coach. The best thing Eddie O'Sullivan could have done was stayed coaching the team. Eddie O'Sullivan. No, I'm talking about in terms of... Eddie O'Sullivan went on the Lions tour in 2005 and came under the influence of Sir Clive. Right? Exactly. <laughs> Clive did everything basically from try to drive the bus to... Uh, he, he was a control freak and Eddie went the same way. Uh, the team were set in stone. There was a second team went out to Argentina. They, in terms of, of the preparation, they had no games played. So I think um, there were so many lessons learned in terms of the preparation for the World Cup in 07. And if things go wrong and you're in the middle of a tournament, it's very hard to turn it around. I think uh, there are lessons there that Ireland will take on board before they go to this World Cup. And I think Joe Schmidt is incredibly shrewd, but he also has Les Kiss on board, who's been there for nine years, and I think the mix of the management team is superb. I also think that, given all the injuries they had in the autumn series, fellas like Reese Ruddock came in from nowhere. Um, you have fellas like Trimble and, and Dave Carney who've been injured, they haven't featured this year. You genuinely have a group of 30 to 35 players now that you didn't have in 07. You might have had 21. So it's a totally different scenario. Do you, do you accept that, George? I mean, to suggest. No. I'm hoping not. Oh, no, seriously. Sorry, George, just before you answer, I, I, I will be coming around. Uh, if anybody has particular questions to ask, please put your hand up. Go ahead, George. Sorry, apologies. But to seriously suggest that Ireland of 35 international players is horses. Complete and horseshoe. Like, we, we, we could, like, we, we do not have an attacking fullback. We have the best catcher of a fullback, maybe. And we have the best left footed kicker, maybe. But we don't have the best attacking fullback. It's not at the races with Halfpenny or Brown or any five that France could pick, maybe, at fullback. And he's probably going forward just about there with Luke McLean. Um, we have two centres, despite, despite ecstatic praise from Donald Lennon 
last Saturday about the Centre <laughs> Partnership. If, as everybody has been telling us since he first came into the frame with Connacht, Henshaw was the logical successor to Brian Driscoll, if that is true, why is he playing number 12? And the, the, there's no doubt, and all coaches do it. I mean, actually, even I did it, funnily enough. All coaches have a bias. USA. All USA. coaches have a bias. <laughs> and he's biased against Madigan, and he's biased against Sebo, and uh, they... they <laughs> Well, well, how's he biased against Zebo? I hear the mask. Because as soon as he had an alternative, he put somebody else in there. No, he had an alternative the week before and he didn't do it. No, listen, I'm getting paid by the minute. At the moment... At the moment... At the moment, Lennon has spoken for 28 minutes and I've spoken for five. Therefore, this is a cheapy gig for me. Um, I believe he's biased. I believe he's certainly biased against Madigan. If Madigan were playing in any other major rugby inter international country, he'd be playing inside centre. He'd be absolutely be playing inside centre. And instead of which, he's down in Leinster, hanging around by Jimmy Goppert, who is never going to play for Ireland, ever, is holding down a position. We have got to have the provinces feeding into an Irish team. I, I, I mean, it's astonishing that Madigan isn't being developed as an inside centre. And he's not. Thanks. All right, let me, let me ask you this. Let's move the focus off. If you were, if you were the chief executive of the RFU, who this week came out and said what England have done over the last four years in coming second was unacceptable whatever we are, five months out or four months out or five months out of a, of a Rugby World Cup. Do you agree with them? Do you think that A, it's unacceptable for England and B, do you think that they have a snowball's chance in hell of getting to a semi-final or better in their own home country for a Rugby World Cup? I think England will do very well in the World Cup. Do you? Well, look, look at the history. 1987, it's played in... Uh, New Zealand, New Zealand win it. 1991, it's played in South Africa. South Africa win it. 1995, uh, it's played in England and no. Australia. No, okay, 95, <laughs> you're, we'll, 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 I yeah, know you're... Yeah, Simon versus South Africa. 95, South Africa. Oh, 91, wherever it was. Uh, it, yeah. Over here, Australia win it. Do you know what, don't, don't let the facts get but in the, the way. Keep going, keep going. Yeah. Keep going. When you, look, when you look at the soccer World Cup or when you look at the Rugby World Cup, home advantage is an enormous advantage. Therefore, England will do very well, which is a semi-final. England, I mean, this idea of the, the championship, albeit this wonderful rugby that you saw and you'll never see it again, you might as well say, you'll be telling your grandchildren, I was there the day they used to score tries at rugby union. Uh, the, the thing is, winning is, there's no difference between Ireland, France, or Ireland, England and Wales. They all won the same number of games and they all lost the same number of games. It was only a mathematical difference, which you know, was coincidence, chance, scrum half dropping the ball, uh, a whole pile of things. So winning the championship on the basis of points difference doesn't tell us an awful lot. We're actually the same as England. And when Wales have better centre partnership, Wales have a better uh, Wales have a better fullback, and um, England have better centre partnership, England have better fullback. So like these teams are good. And it's only in this bloody country where we automatically assume that, you know, instinctively we're going to win the World Cup, never ever have got to the semi-final in the history of the competition. The first thing we should be thinking of doing, which we haven't done on two separate occasions, is actually make the quarter-final. So, like, everybody's saying, oh, sure, it's only Italy and France, Donald stuff will be out of the group. You saw France last Saturday. It doesn't matter how much uh, you think England gave them a chance. We could, they could be difficult for us. Well, the, the, the French are the biggest issue. I mean, France, with all their troubles, France are also saying all we have to do is beat Ireland and we're in the semi-final of a World Cup. 
I mean, that is the big issue. Now, the only thing for England is they're in a dog of a pool. They're with Australia and they're with Wales. They could well be gone at the pool stage. And that is the biggest problem for them. And when I go back, and look, when I'm talking about 35 players, there'll be 31 players in a World Cup squad, right? But we are able to, given the draw that we have, your Canada's, with due respects to America and Canada, Romania, you can play second teams against those. That's what I mean, that you're able to pull back guys, whereas in times past, you had to play all your best players even to win those games. So, it does make a difference. Do you, do you believe, Donald, that, that England are good enough? Uh, I think they've been found wanting, they've been there or thereabouts, they've been very good in some of the, like their best results have been in the autumn internationals. But you must remember, that's when the New Zealands and the Australias and the South Africans are coming at the end of their long season. You look at the flip side of that, what has Ireland ever done in a tour in June in Australia or New Zealand at the end of a long season? Slim, nothing. Exactly, exactly. So, I mean, I, I think... The biggest you're, danger, you're I tell you. You don't remember us beating Australia in Australia with the pride of Prez Cork, Sunday's Well, and UCC, Jerry Walsh scoring the winning try. And Van Esbeck saying, yeah. the great Van Esbeck saying, the greatest performance ever. Yeah. But George, that was 1967, George. We did beat them in a two test series in 1979. But again, don't let the facts get in the way of the truth. <laughs> Right, let me come down to the let me, hang on, let me come down to the chattering classes. Hang on a second. We have a question. Name, year, serial number. Mark Darby, 2010. Uh, <laughs> what is the future of AIL rugby in Ireland if there is any? What is the future of AIL rugby if there is anyone? AIL, is that what you asked? Yes. I tell you, it's very good in Dublin because you keep taking all the fucking players up from Munster. <laughs> But we're not bitter and twisted or anything like that. I tell you, it's a very good question. It is. For somebody who left in 2010. Because <laughs> yeah. that wasn't a vintage year in the CUH from what I'm led to believe. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> and, he, and he also thought... You're away. <laughs> he also thought it was a black tie evening. Go on, but yeah, keep exactly. going. <laughs> no, I think it's an excellent question. I think... Uh, the RFU have turned their backs in the clubs. Uh, we, if we think in Ireland that we're going to produce all our players through academies, we're wasting our time. Uh, there's young fellas, I, I, I feel very strongly about that from, uh, certainly down in Munster there's a tradition of uh, clubs, um, players learning to play for a club, learning to play for the history and tradition that's there, and um, that's all gone. Players change clubs for all kinds of different reasons. Um, but the All-Ireland League, to me, one aim, it's, it's, it's very simple. You have to have a middle ground between the professional game and the clubs. You have to have a development path where um, players who don't get into academies have an opportunity to aspire to being a professional rugby player. At the moment, you have two, contract, two contracted players are allowed to play in 1A and 1B, which is far too little in my view, one of those, uh, you can only have one forward, and yet the 48 clubs in Ireland, spread out over the four divisions, all vote as to how many contracted players can play in 1A and 1B. It's a joke, and uh, I think it's, it's going to come back to haunt us at some stage. It's definitely reduced the quality of players that's coming through in Munster, and if Munster are weak, Ireland will lose out in the long run. We need the four provinces strong. Uh, and, and George, like it brings on the next question, which is a lot of these guys obviously played schools rugby and there are lots of school players around the country and it's played at the very highest level. And yet, and yet, so many leave at 18 and, and if they pick a rugby ball up between at 19 and beyond, it's, it's just not happening. There's such a drop off. Is, is, is that something that concerns you and why do you think it happens? There are three reasons why it's happened. The first one is women. <laughs> 30, 30, or 30 years ago, 
you, you were married and you went out to practice on Tuesday and Thursday and you went to a match on Saturday and you disappeared and didn't come home until dawn. Then there was a match on Sunday and you played in that and uh, the, the, the dear lady at home did the washing up and washed your dirty rugby kit and did all that. The modern woman just won't do that. Like, and... <laughs> oh dear God. Which is the fact that we'll be fact. No, once upon a time, like there's the fellow in 2010 there wasn't even born, right? Once upon a time, and then I will confirm. Once upon a time, on St. Stephen's Day, in every rugby club in Ireland, married versus singles, agree? There isn't an ass's chance of a rugby club today being able to put 15 married guys on the pitch. Because the first fall off, this is true. I mean, look at the facts. Don't be giving me a horn. Don't be giving me a hard time. Look at the facts. Go on, go on. The number of married guys playing the game. Can I get a bigger shovel here then? Therefore, 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 instead of players, Instead of players playing like they used to until they were 30 or 32 or whatever, they are packing up at 24. So you have a school like Blackrock College, the biggest school in the land. Steady, I'm in the room. Like that. Who, 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 who graduates, say, 160 kids, all of whom have played rugby for 12 years. Blackrock College Rugby Club struggles to put three teams in the field where 25 years ago they put 13 teams in the field. The IRFU is saying, oh there's thousands of people playing the game. Horseshit! There's thousands of kids playing the game on Sunday mornings. There's thousands of women playing the game. There's thousands of people playing tag. But the core of the game, which is the question, the AIL, is not get delivering enough players to play. Lennon's point that you cannot have a game that has a link between the, the international and provincial area, professional, and the rest of the game, is absolutely right. There are over 300 million people in America. How many footballers are there, as in Gridiron, 1,000. So the treat, what's the rest of the American population doing? They're sitting in front of the telly, eating crisps and drinking beer. And that's what's going to happen in who had George Clancy of Ireland referee in them because they're similarly incensed at saying if we didn't have George Clancy we would have won. Right. I think we'll I think we'll move we'll move quickly on from that one. Gentlemen here. Uh, Dave Robb leaving shirt 75, 76 and 77. <laughs> Now, this is a question for Donal. Uh, many of us stayed up in the middle of the night, like your mother in 70, uh, 87, to watch you play a quarter final in Ballymore and captain the team courageously against Australia. Where would you fit in the Irish team right now? Well, I tell you Scrum one thing. With a, with, with a memory like that, I don't know how it took you three years to get your leave, sir. <laughs> I think I'd have been a classy old half myself because I'm from Cork Constitution and uh, we always have a bit of football down there. I know, it's, it's, it's a fair question. I mean, the modern guys, I mean, the size of some of these fellas is frightening. Um, the difference between my generation and the modern generation is when we got injured, we put on weight. 
and they get injured now, they lose weight. Seriously, because they're pumped up to the nines. A fellow like Paul O'Connell, who is naturally a slim guy, he eats five times a day. And that's not a joke. He, he, when you see, it's, it's amazing in the, in the, in the, in the, the, the punditry world, you see fellows who are out of the game for two or three years, and they're actually getting smaller because they're not doing their weights, they're not eating, they're not in these supplements and all this type of thing. Um, but I mean, there is an issue with the game. Um, I, I wrote an article about four years ago where I said that unfortunately uh, Jerry Collins and Charles Berger spent the day South Africa against New Zealand running into each other at 100 miles an hour and, uh, uh, from kickoffs. And if your head was out by a millimetre of a, of a fraction, somebody was going to break their neck. And it is an issue in the game. Um, and it's something that frightens me. Royal asked the question, and, and our friend from the 2010 class here, about the school's rugby. What frightens me about school's rugby now is I think you have coaches coming in who are coming out of the professional game, who are up, up, you know, they're on the ladder in terms of making a name for themselves. They're applying the same standards in terms of training that were applied in Munster and Leinster in a professional setup. Young fellas are getting up at 6 o'clock in the morning. They're in the gym pumping iron. They have their isotonic drinks and their tuna sandwiches in their... In their it's, it's ridiculous. And the skill levels have gone out of it. And by the time they have all that attention to detail at school, they come out at 18 or 19 years of age and they're asked to play for the thirds in a club and they're looking for their bag and their free tracksuits and all of this. And... Is it any wonder they give up within two years? There was a survey done in Leinster about four years ago where 76% of fellows who played in the Leinster Schools Cup had given up within three years of leaving school. So therefore, schools rugby, in my view, it's all great to go out and, and we're slagging Ross Gray, Black Rock, but the, the professional, I saw um, Clown Goals. There's a, a facility in Fort Island in Cork. Hotel, pitches, and uh, I think it was Clown Goals. I pulled in one day, I was playing a bit of golf and photo over Christmas, and this bus pulled in in front of me. Next thing I saw, 40 schoolboys getting out into the hotel, and I asked lads, oh, what are you doing? Went, oh yeah, we're down for five-day camp over Christmas. It's, it's ridiculous. Somebody needs to grab a hold of it would, and would, get a bit of sanity into the schools. Ha game. Having said all that, would you like to have been a professional rugby player? Oh yeah, I mean, I would love to. Have, I would have loved to have got the opportunity to be to be the best you could be, which is what they have now. I would have loved to have played in the Heineken Cup because I think you know, travelling around Europe, playing in all these brilliant grounds with the support they have. But and you would have loved a contract for about three hundred and fifty grand. Okay, yeah. <laughs> was it this gentleman here? Uh, Sean Sexton. I'm only a young fella. Uh, um, a Leaving Sir class of 1965. And I have a question to uh, George Hook. Two questions, actually, if I may. Uh, one is, what is, was his greatest sporting achievement in his memory? And the second part of the question would be, uh, what is the greatest gaffe that he committed? <laughs> I like both of those. <laughs> Even Conor McGregor is clapping over here. Go on. My greatest sporting achievement was uh, in the most beautiful cricket ground in the world, the Mardike in Cork, uh, to, to beat the Leinster schools, in which about half the team were from CUS. They were arrogant little bricks. <laughs> and I can name them to you if you want to. And we sent them packing. And the greatest gaff, um, which earned me a fortune, uh, was actually a succession of gaffes uh, to constantly suggest that Munster would lose uh, when they would win. Uh, in fact, had I said Munster will win and they did win, 
nobody would have given a hoot. <laughs> but like everybody used to stop me and say, it's quite interesting when you go to Tom Park in the old days, before the, all the modern stuff, they used to put us on a, on a little kind of ramp uh, down the cheap end of the ground uh, within spitting distance of the crowd. That's why I always used to wear a raincoat. But, uh, <laughs> and then I'd say, like, I must have gone loose and I'd go around the ground, then the match would be over and all these guys would be down shaking the podium. And then we'd have to get out of the ground. And you would walk down, it was the whole length of Tom Park to get out the gate. And you would walk down to this avenue of lunatic monster supporters who would be saying, Hey, George, we told you so. <laughs> now let me tell you about these monster supporters. Bad teeth, breath, <laughs> breath smelling of beer. And the men were worse. <laughs> Teddy, all right. Over here, gentlemen, over here. One of the... I'm thinking 2011. Oh. 2012. It's okay. uh, George, I seen you in Wild Green there during the summer, and I warned you about the, the clamper that was outside. But in a serious note, I'm just wondering what was your max bench, and when did it happen? <laughs> Well, this is probably a bit difficult for a man like you. I suspected past maths. So. <laughs> uh, the, the, because uh, it requires you to multiply by 2.2. .2, uh, I, uh, I benched 180 in pounds. Uh, at uh, 19 years of age in Led Bernabro's gym in Mayfield in Cork. <laughs> I, I, I thought, in fairness, I thought it was an excellent question because he spent all his life on the bench. <laughs> I mean, let's be, let's be fair. Let's be fair. You had to be a fair athlete to get on the Munster cricket team in 1955. <laughs> Aiden Brophy, uh, class of class of 04. Uh, Don, I appreciate you might be might be feeling a bit unloved here, but my question's for George. Big fan, by the way, George. My commute is a dream every every evening driving home, listening to your dulcet tones. But <laughs> the question I have for you, I, I appreciate it's a few months away from the big event, so it's going to be hard to predict. But do you think Finnegan are going to get enough seats to hold on, George? <laughs> Is there going to be a comeback from, from the right side of the tracks? <laughs> well, you can... You can say with absolute certainty, and the reason I can say this with absolute certainty is when I was seven years of age, my brother brought me up to the model school in Cork for the general election, and she brought me into the booth and she said, this is how you vote. Fine Gael 1, Fine Gael 2, Fine Gael 3, stop! Uh, so that is the way I voted all my life. There is no doubt, in my view, that Fine Gael will be the largest party in the next vote. I don't think, I don't think there's any doubt about that. I mean, the mathematics of it simply demonstrate that. The second thing is that there is no doubt that the rising economic tide is going to help them. It's a bit difficult to be an anti-austerity alliance if there isn't an austerity. Yeah. So therefore, the, 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 the big problem for Fine Gael is who, and they will have to coalesce, is who do they coalesce with? Um, because uh, the, the, the left is so fractured that Labour will undoubtedly, percentage-wise, lose more seats than Fine Gael. And as the last surviving uh, member of the pro-treaty forces in the Civil War, uh, my plan ultimately will not be happy until there are no Fianna Fallers in the <laughs> So the, uh, so the answer is, Eddie Kenny will be, 
Enda Kenny will be the first Senegal Taoiseach to be re-elected, but I'm not sure what kind of a government it will be. Don't, just don't. Here we go. Uh, Killian Byrne, part of the loudest SEC of 1989. Oh! Uh, Leinster drew this evening 34 all against uh, Glasgow after a seemingly atrocious first half and a stellar second half. Um, should Leinster fans be happy that we're still within touching distance or should we be calling for Matt O'Connor's head? Don't. Well, I saw the first half of the match. Uh, it was 27 7 when I came down to the bar. So, what are you saying the score was? 34 apiece. 34 apiece. Uh, you'd have to be worried by next weekend. Uh, you can't just press a button and think everybody's going to turn up because Sean O'Brien is back and possibly Keen Healy is back and everything is going to be great. I tell you, I've been amazed at some of the Leinster results in the, in the last six weeks. When you look at the quality of the teams that they've been able to put out, excepting that they have a, a huge amount of fellas involved in the Irish setup, but uh, I would say, is Matt O'Connor under pressure? I would say yes he is. Uh, will Leinster be under pressure next week against Bath? I think they will, because I think Bath play a style of rugby. From what I saw from Glasgow on the opening half where they got three tries where Leinster's defence was non-existent, physicality was non-existent, um, so they have an awful lot of do, to do in a week. Now the only thing I will say is I think with some of the fellas they have to come back, I can see a player-led um, structure this week, so I wouldn't put it past Leinster to beat Bath, but uh, there is there is something going on because the spark has gone out of Leinster. Um, like, given the quality of some of the teams that they've played against during the international window, they've been so far off the pace. It's uh, it's a joke for the quality of player that they have. So I would be worried. Okay, uh, we're, we're I'm conscious of time and people wanted to get to the bar and George needs to get home to his comp plan. So we will we will we will we will just take one or two more questions and I, w I will wrap this up and let you get on with your evening, sir. 2017. <laughs> Thanks very much, uh, David. Uh, my questions for both of the men up there. I just wanted to know they're playing Robbie Henshaw at 12. He's advertised on TV at 13. Do you reckon they're leaving the 13 spot open for Gary Ringrose to come in? Great question! Great question! <laughs> <laughs> Donald, Gary Ringrose, yeah, who, who, who we both. Yeah, we covered the under 20s oh, no. this year. Uh, Gary Ringrose is a, a phenomenal talent. Um, I, I actually think. There's no such thing about whether you're young enough. I mean, I go back, I was involved with Warren Gatson when we took Ryan O'Driscoll to Australia in 1999. Got his first cap before he ever played for Leinster. But my point is, I think Gary Ringrose is more advanced now than Brian O'Driscoll was in 1999. Uh, in terms of his progression. Well, that's, it's not surprising given that he's come through this whole academy system. Uh, professionally, or I accept that. Um, but I, I, I think he's. I, I think the World Cup is too soon for him. It's not going to happen. But I think there's a, a centre partnership of Ring Rose and Robbie Henshaw that's waiting to come together, which could be phenomenal. I mean, the guy, he has it. I'm All right. About it. Just on this side. Hi there. Uh, my name is Jerry Ormond. I 